Good morning. Happy Sabbath. You notice up here in the front, um, some different items on the tables. Uh, the teachers were asked to bring some things that illustrate or symbolize what they do. Uh, their calling as a teacher. And there's all sorts of things up here. There's a yo-yo and a soccer ball and Legos and, of course, books and a tablet. Um, and I think, it, it, to me, it illustrates that um, what our teachers are, is, are doing is not just giving tests um, and educating academically, but in all spheres um, of the lives of, of our students. I invite you to pray with me um, as we begin this morning. Heavenly Father, I'm not worthy to speak your words. Not adequate. Uh, but you are worthy. You are enough. So we turn our eyes, our attention, our ears, we focus them upon you. We pray that you would speak to us. That our hearts would be touched and encouraged and inspired. And that even we would respond, giving ourselves freely to you, just as you gave yourself freely to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, as we are talking about education, as we are welcoming students and dedicating teachers, I want to just take a few minutes to uh, go back with you uh, to the educational system or traditions that were in the place, uh, in place in the time of Jesus. Um, when we think of education, a lot of times we think of our modern setting um, and the, the culture that we are so familiar with. Uh, but the, the rabbinic culture in the time of Jesus and the education um, a culture that was there is fascinating and enlightening uh, as it reveals Jesus as a teacher to us. If you were a Jewish boy, and I have to give a disclaimer, unfortunately in Palestine at that time, um, girls were not officially uh, educated. They were expected to be educated uh, through their mothers at home. Uh, their mothers were encouraged to teach them to read and to write, but um, it was only the boys who were to be uh, educated officially uh, because they were to be prepared, uh, some of them, if they were good enough to be rabbis. So when you were five or six years old, you would enter into what is called Beit Sefer, which literally means house of the book. And you would go to the local Midrash, which is a school. It was often the same building as the synagogue. And at five or six years of age, you would enter into this school, Beit Sefer, where you would be until the age of about 10 or 11. Now, their school day was quite long. Uh, we're told in the Talmud, their stories of, of the children going in the morning after having breakfast and staying there all day long until the evening where they would go home to eat dinner, um, which was a very significant meal because they were not allowed to eat anything in Beit Sefer. They were expected to study and to focus. But on that first day of school in Beit Sefer, as a five-year-old or six-year-old boy, you would be handed a slate or a tablet. Now this isn't an iPad with apps and games. This is a piece of stone or clay and you would have your pencil uh, which was a piece of chalk that could mark it. But on this first day of school not only would you be handed your slate but the rabbi or the teacher would take a jar of honey and he would pour it over your slate. And then you were told or instructed to taste it. So, of course, knowing that dinner was a long way off, you would lick your slate clean of that honey. And the rabbi would say to you, So let the words of God be in your mouth. May they be nourishment to your soul and sweetness to your body. And then you'd get right to it. If you didn't know your Aleph Bet yet, you would learn your Aleph Bet, and then 
for the next five years, you would be expected in Beit Sefer to memorize Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. The Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Now, students, you think you have it hard now, right? Imagine memorizing the first five books of the Bible, and we know that in later traditions, they didn't even start with Genesis. They got right down into the hard stuff. They started with Leviticus. Five-year-olds, six-year-olds, memorizing the book of Leviticus. If you were a prodigious student, if you did a good job, and you had the Torah memorized, then at the age of 10 or 11, you would graduate. You would go on to Beit Talmud, which is literally the house of study. Now, if you were not one of those who's able to memorize the Torah, um, or maybe your family uh, needed you on the farm or whatever your trade was, you wouldn't go to Beit Talmud. You would go back to the fields, you'd go back to the carpenter shop or to your fishing boat or wherever, and the other students, the A students, would continue on in Beit Talmud. Now in Beit Talmud, not only were you already expected to have memorized the Torah, but now you would be expected to memorize the Tanakh. Does anybody know what the Tanakh is? Joshua through Malachi. The remaining portion of the Old Testament. All the history, Kings and Chronicles, all the prophets, all the Psalms, all the Proverbs. You were expected to memorize that for the next three or four years. Now, not only in uh, Beit Talmud were you expected to memorize the Tanakh, but you were also expected to learn Midrash, um, or Mishnah, which were sayings, oral teachings about interpretation that were passed down through the generations, through the centuries, to the rabbis. And you were expected to not only know passages, but you were expected to know how Rabbi so-and-so interpreted this passage, and how Rabbi so-and-so responded to Rabbi so-and-so's interpretation of the passage. All of these were expected to be memorized by the student. Now, if you were a good student, if you studied hard and uh, memorized everything, you would go on to the next level. And by the way, uh, we know that uh, Hillel, a famous rabbi, who was the uh, teacher of Gamaliel, who was the teacher of Saul, Hillel said to his students, the student who studies his lesson 101 times is far superior to the student who studies his lesson 100 times. They were very serious. They were very serious. So if you were the cream of the crop, if you were the A student who was able to memorize the Torah and the Tanakh, you uh, memorize these Mishnah, then you might be able to go on to Beit Midrash which literally means house of learning. Now, Beit Midrash was, you might think of it as kind of the college education of the day. Um, and because it was the college education, it wasn't just um, granted that you would be able to go to Beit Midrash. In fact, what you had to do if you wanted to go on to Beit Midrash, if you were interested in being a teacher of the law, a scribe, or a rabbi yourself, uh, what you needed to do is find a rabbi and go to that rabbi and ask if you could follow that rabbi, if you could enter into their Beit Midrash, and then that rabbi would interrogate you. They would begin asking you about um, the prophet Zechariah and how a, a rabbi interpreted uh, a certain passage. They would be quizzing you about all these things from the Torah and the Tanakh. And if that rabbi thought that you were good enough, they would say, come, follow me. Take my yoke upon you. Now, uh, for a rabbi, their yoke was their school of thought, their way of interpretation. 
Um, and a student of a rabbi would be said to take a yoke, which of course is that piece that oxen use to plow the field. They would be to take that yoke of the rabbi upon them. And the, the, the idea in Beit Midrash is that not only are you going to learn the teachings of the rabbi, but even the thinking of the rabbi, the way that they interpret scripture. Because your ultimate goal in Beit Midrash is not just to be a student with a college degree, your ultimate goal is to become the rabbi. Now, not just any rabbi, not just become a rabbi, but you are to become the replacement for your rabbi. You are to become like them in every way. And so Beit Midrash, it, it, it often happened in a building, but many times these rabbis would be itinerant rabbis. They would go around teaching their yoke, teaching their interpretation, and their students, their disciples, their Talmudim, uh, would be expected to follow them. In the Mishnah, uh, Gamaliel gave some instructions to his Talmudim, and he, he said to them, your teachers, he said, you should be powdered in their, the dust of their feet powdered in the dust of their feet. And what he meant by this is that if your teacher is someplace, if your rabbi is someplace, you are to be sitting in the dust right at their feet. If they are walking down the road, you are to be following so close behind them that their dust is coming upon you. You are to be covered in their dust. Because the disciples of the rabbi, the Talmudim of the rabbi, were expected to become like them in every way possible. So they watched closely not only the things that their rabbi said, but the way they said it. They, they watched closely the way they conducted themselves. They followed them everywhere. They watched them when they ate. They, they, they were there when they slept. They were the constant traveling shadows of their rabbi. Because they knew that if their education was successful, if their training was what it should be, that they themselves would become just like their rabbi. Now, all of this is very interesting in the light of Jesus and the culture and customs that he adopted and the culture and customs that he chose not to adopt. You see, the disciple of the rabbi, the Talmudim, if they passed the course of Beit Midrash, if they were successful, maybe in their 20s, uh, maybe even at the age of 30 or so, they would receive what is called sem semka, where the rabbis would place their hands upon them and say, you are now like your teacher, you are now like your master, you are now like your rabbi, and you now have the authority to teach. You have permission. You have graduated. This was the PhD of the world that Jesus lived in. It's very interesting because Jesus threw out some of these practices. It seems like very intentionally. Uh, if you turn with me to John, uh, chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. Some of the actions of Jesus made no sense to the scribes and the Pharisees and other rabbis um, of his time. John chapter 7, we're looking at verses 15 and 16. When you get there, you can say Amen. Jesus had been teaching in the feast. And it says, And the Jews marveled, saying, How does this man know letters, having never studied? And just pause there for a moment. Jesus is there not only reciting Scripture, but he's giving interpretation. He's giving application. Something that was only reserved 
for the Talmudim who had Semka, who had authority that was placed upon them for the, the, the PhDs and elite. But Jesus is teaching, and they say, wait a minute. How does he even know how to read and write? He never studied. Apparently, Jesus never even entered into Beit Sefer. He wasn't in Beit Talmud. He certainly wasn't in Beit Midrash. I believe Mary taught him. He learned not only to read and write the scriptures, he memorized them, he knew them, he understood how to apply them, but that was wondrous to his listeners because he hadn't gone through the established educational channel. Then notice what he says. Verse 16. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his who sent me. Other place, Jesus in John, Jesus says something very similar. He's asked, By what authority can you teach? What's your simcha? Who's laid hands upon you? Where did you go to Midrash? He said, Uh-uh. My authority does not come from men, but from God Himself. He's the one who sent me. He's the one by whose authority I teach. It's His doctrine. You see, at that time, for somebody to just teach an idea, a new idea, was a very rare sort of thing. When an idea was expressed, you expressed it in this way. Rabbi so-and-so taught his students this. And you were quoting your authority. How you had come to this understanding. What right you had to assert this opinion and this idea. And Jesus, he never quotes any other rabbis. He says this doctrine, this understanding from God. It's from the Father. He is my authority. The other thing that was very interesting about Jesus is the way that he gathered his Talmudim, his disciples. Go with me to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew chapter 4, we're looking at verses 18 to 20. When you get there, you can say amen. Kind of like a Ivy League school, the prestigious rabbis were the ones that everyone clamored to be their students and who also were allowed to be a little more selective in the students they chose. Jesus has very few, at least initially, who are asking to be his Talmudim, his disciple. Instead, he goes looking himself. He goes recruiting and Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Now, pause there for a second. In the light of what we've just learned about Beit Sefer, and Beit Talmud, and Beit Midrash, what is this passage implying about Peter and his brother? Were they the best of the best in terms of learning and memorizing and understanding? No. They didn't make the cut. We don't know if it was in Beit Sefer or Beit Talmud. We don't know where it was. But at some point, 
If they had gone to school, a rabbi had told them, go ply your trade. That's how they would say you failed. And basically, go ply your trade meant go home to your father and learn his occupation. Learn to farm. Learn to build. Learn to fish. Go ply your trade. So Peter and Andrew, James and John and other passages, are plying their trade. They didn't make the cut. And here Jesus goes to them. What does he say? Verse 19. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. This is like Harvard sending an acceptance letter to the, to the student who didn't, who didn't even get the GED. And he's saying, come follow me. Forget about your trade. Enter into my Beit Midrash. Come be my disciple. You know, a lot of times we focus on the sacrifice that they made in leaving their nets. But from this perspective, Jesus was giving them an opportunity of a lifetime. He was giving them something that nobody else was willing to give them. He saw in them uh, 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 disciples that he wanted for himself. And he's saying, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Follow me and become like me. Be my disciples. I will be your teacher. I will be your rabbi. Now, Acts 4.13 gives us a little more insight into the background of Peter, John, fishermen. Acts 4.13, when they had appeared before uh, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, um, not the, yeah, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, uh, the Judicial Council, it says, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled. These weren't people who passed Beit Talmud and entered into Beit Midrash formally. Where are these people getting this understanding and this learning and this boldness to silence even the teachers of the law? And they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. Now take that idea of having been with Jesus and just kind of lodge that firmly in your brain. Because it, we'll see that this system of the itinerant rabbi was not uh, based around the idea of going to school. This idea of the itinerant rabbi was the, the understanding that the rabbi himself was the school. It wasn't something you uh, clocked in and clocked out of. There wasn't an attendance taken. It wasn't part of your day. It was your life. The rabbi himself was the school. And if you were to learn of him, you had to be with him and follow him. His dust powdering you. Mark 3, 13-14 talking about Jesus, and says, He went up on the mountain and called... Notice this. Notice what He's calling them to. He went up on the mountain and called to Him those, himself, those He Himself wanted. And they came, not to school, not to the dorm, they came to Him. He's saying, I am your bait midrash. I am the school. Follow me. Come to me. Then he appointed twelve, that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach. Notice what he appoints them to? That they might be with him. That's the education. Following him around, seeing what he does, hearing what he says, 
watching his mannerism, seeing the, 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 the attitudes and expressions on his face, being with him. And he says, the result, if you come and be with me, I'll be able to send you out and preach. You'll become rabbis and teachers. Luke 6.13 And when it was day, he called his disciples, where to? To himself. And from those he chose twelve, whom he also named apostles. Notice Jesus is saying, I'm it. You're coming to me. You're following me. You're going to be with me. So teachers, students, moms, dads, kids, the very first thing we have to understand about being a disciple is that a disciple means we are with him. Discipleship means to be with him. That is the most basic part about being a disciple of Jesus Christ because he is the school. We're not just learning his ideas and his theology. We're not just learning what he thinks, but we're learning how he thinks. We're learning who he is and we're praying and hoping and desiring that our very lives will be molded after his. And that only takes place in his presence. So the question is, are we with him? Are we with him? And we all know, being with him is not the same as being in church. I wish it always was, but it's not, right? It's not the same even as being in chapel or Bible class. Now we can do those things in His presence. And I hope and pray that we always do. But just because we show up to those things doesn't mean we are with Him. Doesn't mean we are in His presence. I want to speak very directly to the students who are here. Sometimes it's very easy to assume that because we take attendance for you in chapel and Bible class and church and all these things, that you don't need to engage in the process of being with Jesus. But please, don't let those requirements fool you. It's only when we engage our heart that we can really be with Him. I remember... I was a senior here at SVA, and I was going to chapel, I was going to, to Bible class and all of those things, and I, I would even try to, I had a 7 o'clock class, calculus, 7 o'clock in the morning. Anybody here have a 7 o'clock class? Oh, God bless you, bless you. You know, and so to be at a 7 o'clock class, you've got breakfast earlier than that, you've got a shower earlier than that. So I had been trying to wake up in the morning and, and to study and to read, and oh, it just did not work. Just couldn't get to bed early enough in the dorm. My brain was just, oh, it was so numb at that hour in the morning. But in my heart, there was this longing, not to know more about Him, but to know Him. To be with Him. So I remember... Um, making the decision and, and going down to the campus store when we still had one. I bought this little prayer journal and I had an hour of free time after lunch, a free period. And I would go out on the front campus when the weather was nice and I would just sit there and write in that prayer journal. Conversation. Just pour out my heart. And let me tell you, being with Jesus is wonderful. It is wonderful. It is so wonderful. And it's transforming. Because when we are with Him, ultimately, we become like Him. Not right away, but slowly and surely, our hearts are changed. Luke 6 verse 40. 
Jesus was very clear to his disciples what his purpose was, why he had called them to be his Talmudim, what he intended for them. He said, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone who is perfectly trained will be like his teacher. Now just think about that. He's saying, if you're my disciples and your training is mature or complete, if it comes to its fullness, this is the end result. You're going to be like me. Now the obvious thing, and that means that the disciples become what? Teachers, right? They don't stay students. They become teachers. And what do teachers do? They teach. They deeply invest in other disciples. They spend time with them. They show them the way. They teach them and mold them. So he said, you disciples are going to become rabbis. You're going to become teachers. But not only are they going to have the occupation, the calling of being teachers, they're going to be like their teacher. That's not just in the things he says, not just in the, the ideas that he proclaims, but in who he is. They will be like him. Two parts to discipleship. To be with him and learning to be like Him. To be with Him, learning to be like Him. Later on, Paul would tell his disciples, his Talmudim, he said, imitate me as I imitate who? Christ. He said, come along, let's live our lives next to each other, I'll show you what God has shown me. And we'll do this thing called discipleship together. We'll learn to be like Him. Now this calling for students and teachers is a lot higher than what you're going to find in the handbooks of any public school around here. Because it's not just talking about academic success and standards of learning. It's talking about character and who you are and a way of life. And it means that as teachers, your calling is not just in the classroom, but what you say in the hallway, what you do when you're out and about in town, at all times, in every place, who you are is how you teach. I remember when I first became a parent, having this realization that it really doesn't matter what I say. It only really matters what I do. You guys had that realization as parents? I remember my mom telling me, my parents used to tell me, don't ever smoke! Don't ever smoke! It's bad for you, you shouldn't smoke! She watched them go to their graves with cancer, and then she herself picked up those cigarettes. What they said didn't really matter. It was who they were and what they did. So our calling as teachers, as parents, as brothers and sisters in Christ is to be with Him, learning to be like Him. Calling others to be with us as we together learn to be like Him. Today, we're going to take a few moments to have a dedication for our teachers here on this campus. And as I say the word teachers, some of you may only be thinking of employees at SVA or SVAE, but that's not just the teachers that we have part of this family, is it? We are blessed here in this family this church family, with public school teachers. We are blessed with homeschooling parents. We are blessed 
with people who are support staff, who may not teach in a classroom with a book and a pencil in their hand, but they are teaching with a hammer or with some lawnmower keys nonetheless. In just a moment, I want to invite all of our teachers, no matter what shape your teaching looks like, to come here to the front, and we're going to have a prayer of dedication and commitment. But before I do, Pastor Shane, who is unable to be here today, he's asked me to um, read something for you that he has prepared. He said, there are few professions that make a more positive impact for the kingdom of God than that of the Christian teacher. In the classroom, on the ball field, and in the dormitory, Christian teachers live out who Christ is before their students. True, the specific topic being taught may be science or English, or simply how to vacuum the carpet, but for the Christian who teaches professionally, the overarching theme for the school year is always, Behold Christ, follow me as I follow him. Today, it is once again an honor for our congregation to offer a prayer of dedication and blessing and all of you who are teachers. Whether you teach on this campus, in the public school system, or in the home school, you are the forward positioned soldiers of God, heaven's special forces, uniquely called and trained to prepare a generation to know God and to work with and for Him. As Seventh-day Adventist teachers, you carry the additional prophetic duty to prepare an often reluctant world for Christ's soon return. And that is no small task. So today we want to recognize your unique calling and do what we can to send you into the new school year equipped and ready for service. In just a moment, we'll offer a dedicatory prayer on your behalf. But I wish I, I, wish I could be there in person to offer my support as well. In my absence, please accept the following. May the Lord of all that we see and know bless you with patience and strength. May He give you creativity, perseverance, and stamina. May His love and unending passion be yours in profound abundance, both in and out of the classroom. May your lessons be of Christ, lessons both spoken and lived, and may the kingdom of God be a broader, better, and bolder place because of your ministry to your students this year. Thank you for your ministry, teachers. Your students and we are blessed to have you here in our midst. So at this time, I invite all of our teachers, uh, whether here on this campus or in your home or in a public school setting or any place, maybe a college setting, whether uh, with a pencil and a book or whether with a hammer and a vacuum, uh, to come on down here to the front. We're going to have a special time of prayer for you. I invite... Um, those of you um, who uh, aren't coming to the front to kneel with us uh, at that time when we, when we kneel and join us in prayer. We have um, two students who are going to be joining me in praying for our teachers. Basam, where's Basam? Oh, here he is. And Tessa is also going to be praying. So let's do this. Let's uh, just come and kneel here down in the front. Go ahead, Neil, and um, just put a hand on a shoulder of somebody next to you. Invite the rest of the congregation to kneel as well. If some of you are interested, you may come to the front and put a hand on a teacher. We're going to kneel together. Basam is going to pray first, and Tessa is going to pray, and then I'll pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today we would like to pray for a specific reason. We are praying for Christian education, for Adventist schools, the church, but especially for our teachers. Amen. Lord, thank you for teachers that inspire us, Amen. that teach us new things, and who care for us. 
Lord, bless our administrators. Help them to do what's right. Mm -hmm. Help our teachers to keep helping us to learn. Amen. Help our staff who keep us in line. And help all those who are involved in our education and well-being. Mm -hmm. Lord, help us to remember that you are our ultimate teacher. Amen. Help us to draw closer to you and learn how to be like you, Christ Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dear Jesus, I pray for the teachers in our community. Mm -hmm. I ask that you give them wisdom to help kids succeed and the patience for difficult days. Mm -hmm. Thank you, teachers, for the love you show every day. Help them to remember your promise in Jeremiah 29, 11. I say this because I know what I am planning for you, says the Lord. I have good plans for you, not plans to hurt you. I will give you a hope and a good future. Thank you, God, for being our ultimate teacher. Please help our teachers to have one of their best years yet. Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, where would we be without teachers? Where would we be if the generation before us had not invested in us and molded us, if they had kept silent? Thank you, Lord God, for teachers. And we pray, Lord, that as our hands are upon them, that your hand would be upon them. That they would receive divine authority and blessing from you to live out their lives as Jesus Christ lived his. To show an example. To show uh, what love really looks like in this world. To, to uh, show truth in action and practice. Lord God, this is a high calling. Higher than any of us. So we pray that not only your blessing, but ultimately your Holy Spirit would be upon them. That you would fill them with compassion and endurance and patience and creativity and boldness. That you would help them, Lord, in all of the busyness and pressure and demands to keep their eyes fixed upon you because other eyes are fixed upon them. Lord, we pray for the spouses and the children of teachers that you would bless them, that as a family, um, this um, calling and this occupation would be something that brings them closer to you, Amen. that they would serve together and support and encourage one another, and together they would move forward in your kingdom. Amen. And Lord God, we want to pray here for our campus. It seems like the tide of sin and suffering and wrong is rising higher and higher in the world. And we just pray that the tide of love and truth and justice and mercy would rise even higher still. Mm -hmm. That this place could be a place of refuge and of power and of love that the teachers and the students who are here truly would be with you and every day would be more and more like you. Mm. So Lord, we give ourselves to this. We are unworthy, but you call us anyway. You call us, you say to us, come, follow me, and you will make us into fishers of men. So we cling to that promise. We believe that you will do it. We thank you for it. We pray a blessing upon each of us, especially upon the teachers. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.